Hey everybody, it's Sunday, May 25th, 2014, and we are here with episode 100. So thanks for joining me along the way, uh, whether you've been with me since episode 1 or somewhere along the way, maybe episode 10, 30, uh, 50, 90, or whatever. And this podcast has allowed me to touch so many people's lives and given new opportunities and friendships I could have never dreamed of. And one thing I really enjoy doing is meeting listeners, hearing their story, uh, meeting someone who says, hey, I listen to your podcast. You know, it's so cool to meet you in person. And it kind of feels weird because they kind of know you already. And, you know, hearing about how they found the podcast, what they do and how it's helped them is really rewarding. Uh, you know, as I sit here behind the mic uh, every Sunday, you know, putting out episodes. So as I sat around thinking about, you know, what to do for episode 100, since this is kind of a big milestone, uh, I kept asking myself, you know, how can I scale this up? Because if you're listening to this now, you know, in your earbuds, chances are I've never met you before. I mean, I know there's tens and thousands of downloads every month, but I've only met maybe, you know, 20, 30 people, maybe even up to 100. So there's only so much I can do behind a microphone, too. And so I was thinking, you know, what if we could change that? You know, we can take this medium of communication from me talking to you, uh, turn it into a real two-way conversation, maybe in person or through some other uh, medium. Because honestly, sometimes I talk to this mic and I really have no idea what happens. And I know that you're out there, uh, the listener, you know, whether that's in the car, on a commute, on the treadmill, uh, or somewhere on the bus, or walking around your city. And in my first job out of college, my boss once said a phone call is 100 times better than an email, and an in-person meeting is 100 times better than a phone call. So kind of here's what I got in mind. Um, on the week of September 26, 2014, uh, later this year, our good friend Ezra Firestone of the show over at smartmarketer.com. Uh, he's actually hosting an e-commerce event in Austin, Texas in the USA that I'm likely to attend. And afterwards, I was emailing him. I was like, hey, you know, what if I host an event for my own listeners afterwards on Sunday, September 28th? You know, we'll just do a mastermind for 25 listeners uh, of the show. We meet up in person and just talk business. So, you know, this came up to my mind and I talked to Ezra a little bit and he's like, yeah, you should do it. So I think that's what we're gonna do. And so before we get into it, uh, why a mastermind? So one of the biggest challenges as an entrepreneur, I think, is finding people to bounce ideas off of that can relate to your problems. I remember back when I was still in my day job trying to figure this stuff out. And as I'm still trying to figure it out, you know, when you go home, you work in your home office by yourself, you know, a couple hours a day, a couple hours a night, you go to sleep, you wake up, you go to work, and then you just it's just this endless grind. And it just feels, you know, kind of lonely when you don't have someone to bounce ideas off of. And you can't really talk about, you know, SEO, Facebook ads, or pay-per-click with your friends and family, especially if they're working day jobs and aren't really plugged into this space. And I think masterminds are a good chance to have your problems heard, analyzed, and solved by other e-commerce owners. Uh, I've personally been a member of a mastermind called Dynamite Struggle for about two years now, and I've gotten a lot of uh, opportunities, uh, you know, business opportunities for my wallets uh, through that. And uh, I think it's one, one of the biggest impacts uh, in my life. So what we'll do with this event is I'm going to look to rent out a conference room. Uh, we'll bring lunch to cater in and spend an entire day brainstorming business problems with other uh, business owners. So all you'll need to bring is your laptop and get ready to take a lot of notes because the groups will be no bigger than seven people per table. And what happens is everyone will get an hour to talk about their business and have six other people to give ideas from. Uh, some of them, maybe most of them will have had the same problem and dealt with the issues just like you. And I think the biggest takeaway for this event is just have someone else hear your business problems and really get outside perspectives on what works and what should be fixed uh, in your business. And like I said before, the groups will be no bigger than seven people per table. Uh, you'll also be able to meet dozens of other e-commerce store owners just like you. Uh, you know, I really love to meet you in person, especially if you've been a longtime listener. And as a bonus, I'm looking into arranging a warehouse visit of an e-commerce business in the area so we can actually see what happens behind the scenes. Um, there's one I have in mind. Uh, they do seven figures a year. I think it'd be really cool to see what happens when an order comes in their website, You know how it goes through the warehouse, you know how it goes through accounting, how do they fulfill it. it kind of just see what happens at an e-commerce business you know in person i think that'd be super cool so together with ezra firestone's event i think this would be a super cool thing to go to uh, we got three days of hardcore e-commerce masterminding and kind of information exchange so i'll have more details about ezra's event later but in the meantime if you want more information about tickets to my own mastermind the live mastermind uh, join the mastermind email list at buildmyonlinestore.com and click on the mastermind tab uh, i'll send out more details about that event in the coming weeks after i sort out some logistics like you know where are we going to rent the conference room uh, maybe where should you stay uh, things like that so a lot of moving parts i gotta figure out too so join the mailing list there i'm going to send ticket information to that list and i really hope that i can meet you in person that'd be super cool
All right, so now let's get into today's episode, which is a Q&A. So about a month ago, I sent an email to my mailing list uh, about what questions they have for me for this episode. And so here's kind of like the top uh, 10, 8 or 10 that I found. So if you also want to submit a question, just join the mailing list at buildmyonlinestore.com. Uh, every month, uh, I'll send out a Q&A request, and then you can just reply to that, and I'll answer your question uh, on an episode. Don't deliver a product, deliver an experience. You're listening to the Build My Online Store podcast, and I'm your host, Terry Lin. We're here to talk about running an online store and building a strong e-commerce brand to take your online store to the next level. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to check us out at buildmyonlinestore.com. Let's get on with the show. Okay, this first question comes from Carol Rains over at rusticartistry.com. She asks, how do you choose who to interview? Do you contact them or do people reach out to you? And how much time does it take to prepare for interviews? Uh, thanks for this question, Carol. So what I do is uh, I'll look through blogs, either on Shopify, uh, Big Commerce, or Volusion, uh, or I'll look at my friends' Instagram feeds, maybe Facebook feeds, if they're liking any business that looks interesting. Uh, now that I've moved the show to focus on brands, uh, basically someone who has an interesting angle, either the story or the product, uh, I'll just make a list um, of you know these businesses every every time I see them. And whenever I need to do episodes, I'll send maybe 10, 15 emails at a time and I'll batch my interviews. Uh, maybe I'll do like five or six a week and then I'll just have a backlog that I publish uh, every week. And in terms of preparation, I always go with the idea that what can the audience learn from this business and what's something unique that they're doing. So uh, if we're saying like diamond candles that I had before, I noticed that a lot of their customers were using YouTube to share their product and you know how does this affect their marketing strategy? You know, does this affect their paid advertising campaigns and how does this affect uh, their margins in the end? So basically, you know, what's something unique about this business that I think everyone can learn from is the biggest thing that I do and when I look for questions and topics to really drill into uh, the interview. And as far as the actual interview, most interviews usually last about an hour, uh, usually 45 minutes to an hour. Sometimes they go overboard if, you know, the guests, we get along really well. We just talk about random stuff like the weather, where they live, or kind of similar friends we have. And what I used to do is I used to publish the whole hour. You notice that my earlier podcast, maybe from episode one to about 40, they were probably 45 minutes to an hour long. And after that, I started really cutting down on kind of the extra fluff that you don't need in a podcast. So now you'll notice that ever since around episode 50 or later, uh, the podcasts are generally 30 minutes to maybe 40 at max now. And most of them average about 25 to 30 now because I think you know, there's some stuff that's cool to listen, but really the most important stuff in a conversation, uh, I want to just get to it because I think, you know, as a listener uh, right now, you know, your time is limited. I don't want to really, you know, waste your time with stuff that's not that important. And I just want to get you the best information in the shortest time possible. All right. And Carol also asked, have you ever interviewed someone who was a dud to talk to? And if so, did you publish the episode anyway? Uh, I've had about three to four interviews I've done that were just not great and I didn't publish them. And the reason was because uh, I felt like what they said wouldn't really resonate with the audience and it didn't really add much value in terms of uh, what they were telling people was really applicable. So for example, uh, one, uh, one guest I had was, we were talking about SEO link building, right? And I think this was around 2012 when I think Google Panda came out and uh, the business owner was still very new, wasn't really sure about online marketing. And, uh, you know, she was saying she was buying links from Fiverr, right? So when you're buying 5,000 backlinks from Fiverr that are forum links, really low quality, uh, you'll get penalized now. So I think that's information that I know that's wrong. And if I publish that, it may hurt someone's business. So uh, it's situations like that where I can choose not to publish the interview. And, and sometimes I'll just take those sections out. But most of the time, you know, if it's at that level, what I'll do is I, I won't tell the guest I don't publish it. What I do tell them is that I'll... Uh, change it into a text format uh, because my audio levels were off and you know I try not to put the blame on them because they did take an hour of their time to talk to me and I think it's kind of disrespectful to say you know your interview sucked and I'm not going to publish it so what I do is I kind of put the blame on myself uh, kind of tell them a white lie but uh, you know it, it is what it is so I definitely put the audience first uh, based on what I know on the information side if something's wrong or bad advice I will take it out uh, because I don't want to hurt anyone's business uh, by listening to this podcast all right, the next question comes from Steven over at hiddensocksclub.com.au, and he has two questions. How would you know if your e-commerce site is a hero or a zero, and how long should I run my business before facing reality and putting time, money, and energy into another idea? So Steven, what you're looking for is kind of the answer 
of a strict yes or no and really it's a gray area because it, it depends so one thing that you need to take into consideration is your finances so how much time do you have to really see this thing through because you never know if your business just takes longer to build or if it's a bad idea and it depends on your time and money you have so how much money do you have in the bank and what are your goals for this business so do you want to make five thousand dollars a month ten thousand dollars a month and if you want to make five thousand dollars a month you got to work backwards and say all right what's my average sale price uh, what are my margins and based on that how many units do i need to sell per day and say you assume some conversions rates of say one to two percent and based on that how many visitors do you need today and then you compare that to where you are right now and see how realistic that is and if you actually have the time or are willing to invest the time to see this through for three six months so what i would do is i would set a date in the future uh, say you know six months from now I want to be making X amount and if I don't then I will move to a different idea and I think uh, this isn't really a cut and dry yes or no answer uh, it depends on your finances and how much time uh, you want to put to this and a good resource I'll link to this is actually Billy Murphy's podcast forever jobless uh, he kind of talks about this more in depth on one episode that I'll link to so make sure to check out the show notes of this episode at buildmyonlinestore.com and uh, episode 100 uh, is SEO still worth doing? Should e-commerce store owners invest in SEO practices to rank on Google's first page? Does it convert buyers? I have heard mixed advice. So I think the first thing to understand is that SEO is kind of a different part of the funnel uh, when you look at your whole e-commerce store. So if you look at a sales funnel with the four stages, awareness, interest, desire, action, uh, SEO is a very top level funnel thing because when people are searching for keywords, uh, you rank for them and then they go to your site and then they figure out what you're about and then they buy from your store. So it's a very top level funnel thing. And when you say SEO converts or not, um, it's kind of out of context because when people, for example, when you're buying like a new backpack. There's so many out there to choose from in the market. You'll probably Google, you know, the best travel backpack. And really that's a top level thing, right? You don't really search for the brand term uh, until later. And so I think when you're talking about SEO from that level, you know, definitely on site you should do, uh, but off site, the link building, it depends on your product, right? Are your customers sharing them automatically kind of through referral uh, and you're getting organic growth through that? Or uh, do you really want to invest in uh, ranking on the first page? And I think it depends on your niche too. Uh, you know, maybe some B2B things, it might make more sense to uh, rank on the first page because, you know, no one really talks about, uh, you know, like industrial hardware equipment on Facebook, right? So I think it depends on your niche. And, and the other part about SEO is that it's, becoming more and more of a tool of an entire marketing strategy where it's no longer, you know, you can just rank for keywords and get a bunch of sales. Maybe like five, 10 years ago, it was like this. Now, now you hear a lot about content marketing and really if SEO is just about getting good links, uh, you know, it's kind of falling into PR a little bit, uh, you know, making quality content that gets shared and linked to. So the line's getting blurred, I think, but, uh, you know, like I said, it depends on your niche and if it makes sense to actually do that. SEO has also hit a crossroads with content marketing in the last maybe year or so. And uh, Moz actually had a great article about how this convergence is happening, uh, where SEO used to just be link building, uh, maybe with okay quality content, but now it's getting harder and harder to really get the good links. And so it kind of falls into content marketing where you need to make uh, awesome stuff to get brand awareness and get people to kind of find you so i'll post uh four articles from there from moz uh you know it's kind of over the topic uh in this episode it's a whole other episode itself so i'll link to those articles uh, check it out at buildmyonlinestore.com right, the next question comes from troy my wife and i own a small photography business that has sustained itself for over three years with us as the only employees. We've hit some rough times with medical issues and the business has come to a standstill. How do you determine if getting a job to fund the business is the correct choice while we struggle to build the business back up? If it takes time to find a job and then 40 plus hours a week to work, uh, could that time be better spent on building the business? Uh, so Troy, uh, sorry to hear that you have uh, medical issues holding you guys back down. Uh, what I would do is Look at your personal finances, uh, see how much you guys are spending a month exactly. And you want to be really honest with yourself, getting to the bottom of all your expenses. So you know, how much you're spending on food, gas, electricity, water, everything, and maybe even estimate your medical bills. And I think once you figured out your personal expenses, you'll know exactly how far away you are from either getting a job or building the business. Now, usually uh, building a business, even in, you know, a lot of people I talk to their experience, you know, things always take twice as long, twice as more expensive and twice as much energy. So, um, you know, one thing I would also do is, I don't know if you guys have a financial runway, because if you're going to 
have uh, pressure for medical expenses and you guys are running low on money and you're building a business, I think that's a very uh, risky situation to put yourself in. So, uh, you know, maybe if one of you guys finds a job, uh, that might be something to look into, but I don't know your exact finances, how they work um, to get, really give you advice. Because if you have, say, you know, 50,000, 100,000 in the bank, that can give you the timeline to really build uh, this business up. Uh, you know, it, it's a very different situation than if you only have a little bit of money and you're kind of short on cash to build a business. And what you don't want to be in is a desperate situation where uh, you're kind of back against the wall. Uh, and you're, you, maybe you'll, you know, you'll do things that aren't really in the best decision because you need the money. Now, that's not to say that it won't work for you because there are plenty of store owners I've talked to that because their backs were against the wall, they were forced to figure out something that works. And uh, I don't know if that's good advice to give to everyone because I think it does take a certain risk profile and determination to figure that out. And when you're really when your back's against the wall, uh, you either make it or it's bust. Right. So, um, you know, I certainly don't want anyone to go bust listening to this podcast. Uh, so make sure you you know think about that really hard and uh, what you want to do. So hope this helps. Personally for me, just to give you some information on how I made the transition. So in September 2011, I knew that I wanted to leave uh, investment banking. And what I did at that time was I had spent a lot of money on just random stuff like clothes, food, shoes. What I realized was that if I wanted my time, income, and mobility freedom, I needed to start saving money. Uh, at that time, I didn't really know what I was doing. I started making niche sites. Uh, you know, through like these Amazon sites, affiliate links, and they didn't really make much money. So I figured, you know, why don't I give myself a year or so to figure this online thing out? Because I know it takes time while I build a financial runway. And back then, uh, you know, I didn't really have high expenses once I cut everything down. And, you know, I was able to save around like $3,000 every month post expenses. I did have a nice job, you know, at a finance uh, position. So uh, what I did was, as I built that runway, I kept trying to figure something out so that eventually, say, it was making you know 500 bucks a month, I could eventually quit my job, uh, and then kind of go full time on this. And also, your situation is a little bit different than mine. You know, I'm at that time I was 28, single guy, you know, no kids, uh, had a small mortgage, you know, uh, no wife, so no really, you know, things that kind of had other priorities. So I was able to fully focus on this. Uh, you know, cut everything ruthlessly out of my expenses and just focus on this full time uh, after I got home at work. But in the end, like our friend, uh, Tropical MBA, uh, Dan Andrews says, you know, personal finance is the ground zero of entrepreneurship. So definitely try to get that nailed out first and then see how a business or if a job makes more sense uh, to kind of help you out in that situation. Because I do know you have medical pressure, uh, maybe health insurance is something you need to alleviate that. So uh, maybe figure that out and then uh, let me know how this goes. The next question comes from Joel over at NewLifeChristianJewelry.com. What is the most important marketing tip that has run in the most amount of traffic and sales for your e-commerce store, BallerLeather.com? What are the two to three things that you keep in mind when you create marketing campaigns? So the two things that have brought the most traffic and sales to my e-commerce store has been guest posting and custom orders through my mastermind. So let me go through these uh, one by one. So guest posting, uh, as I said before, I used to work at a finance job uh, at an investment bank. And back then there were these blogs that we always read, kind of industry gossip blogs that you only knew if you worked in the industry. Uh, one, it was called Here is the City. And basically this uh, website is a British run blog. Uh, they talk about hiring, gossip, uh, bonuses, things like that, that happened within uh, the finance world. And so uh, I was a big reader of this blog along with all of my colleagues. Uh, virtually, if you ask, you know, 10 people in the business, probably five or six read this blog. So I knew that when I was leaving the job that this would be a great tool to guest post on because after all, I did come from the field and they've always featured entrepreneurs that left finance to, you know, go a different path because it highlighted a lot of what people aren't happy about in the industry. And I think over the years since 2008, a lot of finance people have left like myself uh, to pursue entrepreneurship. So I think there was an angle for that blog. And what resonated with that blog was that a lot of people who read it uh, kind of really appreciated my story about um, you know my journey into entrepreneurship. That's kind of the first article I wrote. It was six things I learned uh, in entrepreneurship since leaving finance. And a lot of the lessons I learned at a bank really carried over, you know, things like uh, customer relationship management, uh, you know, setting expectations, uh, clear communications, and kind of just on a very high level, just being a, you know, social and, you know, good person with clients. And how do you translate that into your own customer service operations? So that was an article I wrote about. Uh, what happened was that it went live 
uh, I think two months ago in March and initially I got about 3,000 visits to the website the first day and then it kind of dropped off like blog traffic so I think it went from 3,000 to like 1,000 to 500 and overall that whole campaign I sold about uh, I think $700 worth of products just from that one guest post so what I'm doing now is you know since it's working it's working well uh, one of the things with blog traffic is that once you get featured you know, and new content comes out, yours kind of dies down. The half-life is really short. So the idea is that if you want to tap into this traffic repeatedly, you need to become a contributor, right? Like, you know how in newspapers there was like Ask Annie or something like that, and she had a column every Friday. So you, it's kind of something you expect, and it becomes a series, and then people uh, kind of know who you are, and you can always tap into that blog traffic uh, over and over again. All right, so second has been custom orders from my mastermind group. So uh, as you know, I'm a ma member of the Dynamite Circle over at Tropical MBA. Uh, it's Dan and Ian's thing. And so uh, what I've been doing there is uh, rebranding my wallets under other people's companies' names. So uh, some people run web design shops, agencies. They have maybe five to ten people on staff. And what they want to do is they want to make a custom wallet for their staff as a thank you gift with the company logo on it and it's something they can expense and while they do that they can also help me out in my business and that has been uh, the second thing that has been really driving sales because I think once people get a custom order from you everyone else sees it in the mastermind and they start to think hey this would be cool for my logo with my company too and something really really unique you can give to either your staff uh, your VIP customers or just you know any anyone you want to impress with because I think when you have something personalized uh, it's a very powerful impression that it gives on someone too so that has been the second channel that has been really worked well and uh, one thing that's exciting now is that i'm working with a guy that does industry conferences so for for software uh, apps and kind of things like that so you know when you get into the conference circuit where you have you know five thousand people a thousand people attending an event uh, maybe these guys want to make thank you gifts for the speakers uh, maybe we can do things like give them the custom twitter name on it uh, maybe the company logo or like a quote they said something really cool i mean we can really do a lot of stuff and i think when you give people this optionality that they can have this product that's really unique one of a kind for their staff vip clients or something uh, it really adds a unique edge to their business all right, the next question comes from RJ Diaz over at industryportage.com. Do you have a good system for using analytics and have you made any changes due to those figures? So I'll be honest here, I am not really a good analytics guy. Uh, I read some other blogs on how to set up analytics, but in terms of looking at the data, I mean, I have an idea of what I do. I look at like the cart uh, page, you know, what, what are people adding? I look at heat maps. I think the biggest thing I've done is in Google Analytics, there's a thing called funnel visualization. So what it does, is basically you can set certain parameters in your website to create a funnel. So what it do is say someone visits your website, you would set a funnel such as uh, someone goes to your homepage, then they go to a category page, then they go to a product page, and they go to the thank you page after they've bought something. So the funnel will basically tell you, all right, a thousand people visited the dot com, uh, 800 people dropped out, 200 continued to the category page, and out of that 200, you know, 100 went to the product page, out of that 100 people at the product page, you know, 20 people ordered, and they got to the thank you page. And they'll actually visualize this for you in analytics, and you can see how many people drop off as they go through the funnel. And I think that's really important because when you're optimizing your funnel, you can figure out which point has the biggest leverage because you know if your bottom funnel is doing really well but the top is doing you know not that great you know you can actually visualize this in analytics they have a flow chart for you of how many people are dropping in and dropping out and where are they going after that so it really gives you like a compass in terms of uh, kind of where do you optimize your analytics and i think that's what i found to be uh, really useful and i'm still figuring this out too i'm not like an expert on this so uh, you know there's probably better guys on this that I should get on the podcast. So uh, I'll, I'll let you guys know when that happens. All right, so that's it for this episode 100 of the Build My Online Store podcast. Uh, if you want more information about the live event that we're looking to do in September uh, on the 28th, Sunday, uh, make sure to go to buildmyonlinestore.com, click on the mastermind tab, and join the email list there because that's where I'll be sending more information about the event in Austin, Texas, and also uh, tickets, so how to attend and some more details of where we're going to host this mastermind, uh, how it's going to work, you know, who's going, and kind of which business we're going to visit as kind of a surprise uh, e-commerce uh, warehouse visit. So I uh, hope to see you guys there. Uh, thanks for joining me in this journey. It's been two years, and I look forward to keep publishing episodes until uh, whenever. So thanks again, and hope you guys enjoy this. 
Thanks for listening to this episode of the Build My Online Store podcast. If you want the show notes, make sure to check out the website at buildmyonlinestore.com. If you've got an e-commerce store, every two weeks I lead a live mastermind call with about five or six of the listeners in two separate groups where we work openly together and solve a business problem that you have. And we're all there to support each other. So if this sounds like your cup of tea, make sure to check us out at buildmyonlinestore.com slash mastermind. Thanks again for tuning in and I'll catch up with you guys next week.